Yeah, I'm broadcasting now. Kumi? Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the SOAS Festival of Ideas and to our Poetry Masterclass. My name is Harris Laspas and I work in the alumni office here at SOAS. Um, as someone whose day job is to be in touch with our uh, old students, I'm delighted to introduce our alumna, uh, Suhema Manzul Khan, who will run our Poetry Masterclass today. Uh, Suhema is an educator, writer, and poet from West Yorkshire in the UK. Her writing asks questions about uh, questions of history, race, knowledge, and power, interrogate narratives about Muslims, migrants, gender, and violence. In her works, she's less interested in disproving such narratives than asking who benefits from them. So Hema has won the run-up for the Roundhouse National Slum in 2017 with her viral poem, This is Not a Humanizing Poem, which gained 2 million views and she was shortlisted for the Outspoken Prize for Poetry in 2018. 
In 2018-19, she was a Nicola Thoreau Fellow at the Roundhouse, and she's currently an associate artist at the theatre company Freedom Studios, that is for 2020-21. Uh, she's the author of the poetry collection Postcolonial Banter, and co-author of the anthology A Fly Girl's Guide to University, Being a Woman of Color at Cambridge and Other Institutions of Power and El Elitism. She also hosts the Breaking Binaries podcast. Uh, welcome, Suheima, and thank you so much for being with us. Over to you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Harris. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, Asalaamu As Alaikum. Peace. Good afternoon. Um, I'm really excited to be here today. Uh, I didn't quite realize the format was a webinar, so I'm definitely feeling uh, a lack of ability to engage with you all, but we can engage with each other and we will be doing so in the chat function. So I just wanted to say before we start, please feel free to just chat as much as you want um, in the chat function. Hopefully you can see it, access it from the bottom of your screens. Um, and if you just make sure you're writing to um, all attendees, then we can all kind of interact with each other. Um, so this masterclass, as some of you know, is part of Decolonizing, it's not just the buzzword, festival um, at SOAS. And I think it's interesting to kind of situate this masterclass in that setting. Um, I'm going to spend a bit of time sort of framing what I, how I see poetry to fit within that. And I just want to say before I do, you know, have a notebook handy or your word app or whatever it is that you're using today to, to kind of write poetry, make notes. Um, I am of the opinion that, you know, try and note down whatever, any sets of phrases, words, anything that sticks out to you, even in this kind of preamble, um, or just anything that comes to your own mind from maybe anything that I provoke um, for you. Um, and I'll probably ask also at some point for us to just like intro ourselves, even just in the chat, because it's nice to know who's here. Um, but yeah, to begin with, I think it's interesting to think about poetry in this context of decolonizing. Um, and I think for me, this immediately evokes, um, you know, the notion of decolonizing is not just a metaphor. Um, and I think it's important for us to remember that in this context, that decolonizing, um, if it is to have any meaning, has to have a material meaning. Um, it has to, you know, ch functionally change relationships, um, change systems um, of extraction, of exploitation, um, of power. And so it, I think it would be easy to say that in that context, then poetry doesn't, you know, it doesn't have a place, what place does poetry have? Um, but to the contrary, actually, I would say that when we know that language has been so central to upholding coloniality, um, when we know that language has been what limits or allows for our imaginations, but also what has been, you know, made to define us, we have been made to define ourselves through language, um, you know, nations have been named, we give language to decide kind of the categories of existence of people, um, human value, ontology, all these different things, you know, language has a really important function. And even on a very basic level of, you know, the English language as a tool of colonizing, as a tool of kind of capturing minds, as a tool of assimilation of people into a certain um, bureaucracy, hierarchy, etc. So with language being that, I think poetry does have a place and I think it does have a place in kind of fracturing, dismantling, disrupting um, relationships of power and uh, coercion and domination. So I mean, just a few quick points before we start, I mean, we will get into the poetry in a second, but I think it's important to situate poetry then more broadly in the way that I like to approach poetry. So for me, poetry was always something that, you know, I, I grew up in the UK um, at school when we did poetry, you know, it wasn't particularly interesting. It was something that felt very classed. Um, it was very inaccessible. Um, it was in a language that, you know, whilst it was English, it was a very certain style of English that wasn't really, you know, vernacular wasn't really something I shared with, you know, wasn't, it wasn't shared with me and my classmates. Um, and I think there's a, there was a formality with it as well that kind of asserted that this is something that isn't for you. It's not something that people like you do. And I mean that in, in both like a, not even both, but in a, you know, a racialized way, in a classed way, um, and even in a gendered way. And I think poetry sort of has all these connotations about what it was. On the other hand, I think where I am now, you know, I acknowledge and understand poetry to be something very different to that. Um, and when I think of poetry, I'm thinking of a tradition of prison poets, of anti-colonial resistors. Um, I'm thinking of a global tradition of, you know, 
uh, guzzles of songs of different types of literature. You know, we think of Somalia is a nation of poets. We think of Persia, we think of indigenous peoples across the world. Um, I think when I think of poetry, I'm thinking of oral traditions. I'm thinking about the fact that the majority of people for the majority of time have not experienced poetry as a, a written and read aloud medium, but as something that was always oral, that it was always audible, that was shared, that was um, spoken and performed. And so I, I think it's also important to think about poetry as um, disruptive to the Eurocentric logics of history. So something that was used to archive our histories, right? To tell stories. We call this thing storytelling, right? But storytelling has always been a medium of, of archiving, I would say, and of kind of um, evading what the, the colonizing kind of gaze of what history is. You have all these disruptive memories, oral histories, testimonies, records, songs, uh, poems uh, that tell us something else, that tell us, I would say, that kind of disruptive un underbelly of history. Um, so I think of that and I think poetry as a form of speaking um, lends itself to disruption and to fracturing. And so that's where I want us to situate ourselves today. Um, and so if a colonial gaze or a colonial language is one that seeks to flatten us, to define us and divide us, then I think poetry can push back at that. It can question, it can, um, you know, through form, through style, through content and, and through performance and through so much more, through the ways we embody it and we don't, I think poetry can become a kind of a language that is other. And I know, obviously, I'm not the first person to say this, but this is the tradition that I'm trying to situate today in. Um, and I think also of Audre Lorde's Litany for Survival when she says that, you know, poetry is also about survival, right? And I think there's, there's an essence in, in a sense in which poetry has always been about survival, about resistance. Um, and I think in this moment, it's exciting to think of it also as maybe one of the few spaces that we can imagine alternative visions of the future. Um, and I say that because, you know, it's... I think we are trapped by the language and the images that we often see repeated around us. And I think poetry provides uh, a place for us to kind of speak back uh, and push back and kind of provide our own. So the way that this session will work um, is quite simple. I'm gonna provide a series of prompts. I'm gonna be sharing some resources, some poems, some ideas. Um, and I'm just gonna give you the time to, to write basically. And in the last half hour, um, I am hoping that people might want to share some of their work, um, and if so, you'll kind of be able to be facilitated to, to come up here where in this, uh, this bit of the internet that I'm in, this, this space, and be able to share your work. Um, and I think we can also probably, um, you know, if people wanted to do that, I'm sure we can stop the recording for that part or whatever, and, you know, I'm sure we can make a way for that happen. Um, I think, yeah, the main, just, I'm just looking in the, the box now for a second. So, um, I can see some of you have introduced yourselves, um, and it would be great, you know, to hear from others too. Um, so I'm hearing, you know, really interesting point about, yeah, poetry as folklore, nursery rhymes that can be used to explore childhood trauma. Um, that's really fascinating. And I think that's also that thing of poetry being a form of embodied knowledge. Like, I think there's a way in which we um, are able to express types of knowledge that are not really... Um, recognized as legitimate whether it's in educational institutions or elsewhere because you know it's not a, a kind of empirical knowledge right it's a knowledge that's embodied and I think poetry allows us to express that um yes in Nigeria poetry has been used as a tool for recording revolution history facilitating protest exactly um and this is a tradition I want us to tap into today um if other people would like to just maybe just like say uh, your name um yeah, if you just say, you know, your first name, hi, I'm such and such, um, maybe where you're watching from today. Um, I'm in Leeds, not particularly interesting weather outside. Um, it would just be nice for me to, you know, feel like I'm not talking to myself. Um, so please do so. Um, and I'll move into the, the first um, kind of section. Um, hi, Hiba. Um, hi, Kelsey. Hi, Francis. Hi, Leah from Newcastle. Great. <laughs> um, Wow, Montreal, amazing. We're really glad to have you here. Hi, Safa. Um, that's cool. Nice to East London, of course. Good to have East London in the mix. Hi, Tanha. Um, hi, Sheffield. Sorry if I said your name wrong. Um, from Chelmsford. Zoe from Birmingham. Hi. Maya from SOAS. Not from SOAS. So that's just like another city. Um, cool. Shepali, sorry, thank you. Nida from India, watching in London right now. Okay, awesome. 
um, Ashika, History of Art student, awesome. Somerset, Selma, Praveen from India, awesome. I can't tell if that's Ayant, Ayanto or Lanto, sorry, really sorry. Um, Kelsey from Southwest London, studying, awesome. I hate it, everyone. Yeah, I'm not surprised. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm really sorry to hear that and si simultaneously not surprised. Um, Alfie, okay. Awesome, keep them coming. Um, I'm gonna jump in. So to begin with, um, I think I just want us to be able to kind of get in the zone. So wherever you are, I don't know what space you're in. I don't know if you, you know, if it's quiet, if it's noisy, if you're on your phone or your laptop, uh, computer, whatever. I think just try to like create a bit of space for you um, in this moment. Um, I'm just gonna get us to do free write basically. So for, I'm sure a lot of you do know, but if anyone who doesn't know what free write is, the goal is basically to not have a goal. Um, I think a lot of times when we write, particularly as adults, and I find this a lot when I do workshops with um, young people and children, they can write, they don't need permission. I think sometimes as adults, we maybe feel that we need permission to write. So the goal of a free write is just to actually write with nothing in, there's no kind of, no one's gonna read this. You don't have to give it to anybody. You don't even have to read it back. Um, it's just to get your kind of mind in that creative space. Um, and I would say one of the good things about free write as well is, is not to stop. So when you're writing, um, don't, you know, often I think we would kind of stop to think like, what's the next word that should come? Is this gonna make sense? Will it, you know, is that conveying the right feeling? The idea here is not to really stop, just write freely. And I'm gonna give you some prompts because I think I want us to start in a space where we are kind of, in the same headspace. Um, but these prompts are to get us really thinking outside of today's goal, I think is really get us thinking outside of the lenses that are upon us. So to move to finding our own voice. And what I mean by that is that I think there's a tendency to kind of write within either paradigms or labels or speak back to categories that we've been told that we, we are or we should. Um, and, and that's fine. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, Sometimes, um, as an example, I guess people who are of a certain diaspora, um, if that's a thing that people, you know, feel that they are, then they, I think there's a tendency to kind of write about, you know, what it means to be this diaspora, what it means to be, um, and I think there's the space for that. I think that's therapeutic. I think it's important. But what I also want us to think about today is what it means to, to, to not think about writing to a particular, to, in a language or to an audience that I think can voyeuristically kind of consume our traumas or the different experiences that we have. Um, and I'm not interested in us writing kind of, I am not poems. And what I mean by that is often we spend a lot of time, yeah, I think about Toni Morrison's quote a lot where she said, um, they will tell you you have no history. So you spend 20 years proving that you do. They will tell you your skulls are too small. So you spend 20 years proving that they're not. And after that, you know, 40 years have gone by and I'm, I'm paraphrasing the quote is much more beautiful, but the point being, I think I'm not interested in today us writing those poems, <clears throat> poems that kind of are push back and explain and say, I'm not what you say I am. I'm much more interested in us finding who we say we are. And, and that's it. And there's no justification. There's no disclaimer. There's no caveats. Um, and you can take that, you know, to mean whatever it means for you, wherever you are. Um, so I'm just going to share some prompts um, with you. And you could use these to prompt your free write. Um, alternatively, you can just write your own free write. Um, I'm going to share them in the chat, but I'm also just going to read them to you. So the first prompt, and this is just like what you would write on your piece of paper and then keep writing and don't stop for five minutes. Um, so I've just come up with four. They're a bit random, but I hope they might tap into something for you. So um, the first one is when nobody is looking, I can be. The second one is when I turn away from the usual questions asked of me, I find the third one is, if I could find my own words to describe myself, I would say. And the fourth one is, when I listen to my inner voice, I hear dot, dot, dot. So I'll just put them in here in the chat. And I'm going to give us, um, there we go, uh, five minutes. So till 3, 23, 24, um, I'm going to put myself on mute. Feel free to play music if that's how you write. But I would actually say for this free write, maybe just tap into the quiet, um, listen to yourself. So get your paper, get your pen, laptop, whatever. Don't stop writing, no one's gonna read it. Um, five minutes, off you go.
take the next sort of 30 to 40 seconds to finish up wherever you're at. And don't feel pressured, like that was just, if you got something out of it, you got something out of it. If you didn't, at least we've all written something now. Okay, so um, I just saw a couple more comments in the in the chat as well. So um, so hi to those people I didn't say hi to, um, and uh, there was uh, yeah two just two interesting things I wanted to pick up on, and one was um, hoping to use poetry as provocation, and I think like that's definitely what I want us to get out of today to to some extent, to whatever extent you want to bring that into your work. And the other was around um, English language itself and kind of how that's you know English has been such a tyrannical um, experience for so many of us. Um, and I, I would really encourage you to write in whatever language feels comfortable um, and definitely write in English, even if you don't, you know, if you kind of feel that imposter syndrome or what, whatever it is, because, you know, uh, <laughs> English is definitely not, I, there shouldn't be at this stage, I think, any ownership over a language that has, has kind of so, uh, so mutated, but also been, I hope, kind of transformed into different things in different places. So, yeah. Uh, ju that's just a note. So I'm going to move us into um, the next exercise. Well done. You've all got something on your pages already. So and that's just because I know we'll all be at different um, stages with this. So the next poem, um, sorry, the, the first poem I, I'm going to share with you guys um, is by Asata Shakur. And um, I'm sure most of you know who she is. And if you don't, I'll just give you a quick background. So Asata Shakur was born in 1947. Um, she's still alive. She's in Cuba in hiding from the US government because she was a member of what was called the Black Liberation Army um, in the US and a freedom fighter basically who exposed the tyrannies of the US capitalist white supremacist machine. And she was targeted pursued, harassed by the FBI for years. Um, she was then charged with several crimes. Um, there was a huge manhunt for her until they eventually um, got her and she was held in, you know, awful psychologically terrorizing um, conditions. Um, she was charged with murder, armed robbery, kidnapping, and this is all despite kind of medical evidence to the contrary, kind of suggesting, she, you know, she couldn't have done these things. Clearly she was political. Um, prisoner and attacked due to her, her politics but she escaped prison in 1979 and since then she has been in political asylum in Cuba um, or she sought political asylum in Cuba um, but yeah it's quite extraordinary I mean she's still on the FBI's most wanted terrorist list um, and so I think it's, it's important to um, you know situate her work there what does it mean to be so politically threatening to the status quo to you know the imperialist um, center um, so we're going to look at her poem, Affirmations. I'm going to put it up on screen share. Um, I'm saying that and I'm not like doing it. And then I just want us, I'll read it out. Um, and just in the chat box, feel free to kind of just respond with anything that stood out to you, what lines you like, any thoughts, any responses, any reflections. Um, so here we go. Let me actually just share it. Here we go. So uh, hopefully you can all see that. Um, I, I'm, I'll read it out. Um, I don't know if it's too small, so I'll just zoom in. Um, so it's called Affirmation. I believe in living. I believe in the spectrum of better days and gamma people. I believe in sunshine, in windmills and waterfalls, tricycles and rocking chairs. And I believe that seeds grow into sprouts and sprouts grow into trees. I believe in the magic of the hands and in the wisdom of the eyes. I believe in rain and tears and in the blood of infinity. I believe in life and I have seen the death parade march through the torso of the earth, sculpting mud bodies in its path. I have seen the destruction of the daylight and seen bloodthirsty maggots prayed to and saluted. I have seen the kind become the blind and the blind become the bind in one easy lesson. I have walked on cut glass. I have eaten crow and blunder bread and breathed the stench of indifference. I have been locked by the lawless, handcuffed by the haters, gagged by the greedy. And if I know anything at all, it's that a wall is just a wall and nothing more at all. It can be broken down. I believe in living. I believe in birth. I believe in the sweat of love and in the fire of truth. 
and I believe that a lost ship steered by tired seasick sailors can still be guided home to port. So uh, I'm just going to see if I can actually still access the chat. <laughs> yeah, here it is. So yeah, um, feel free to kind of respond with what maybe stands out to you, what lines you like. Oh, I can't seem to actually access it. Hmm. Um, <laughs> Okay, I'm, I will just have to stop sharing. No, that can't be right, can it? Uh huh, I found it. Okay, yeah. Um, feel free to friend. Yeah, share in the chat. Like any lines that stood out to you, anything that you found interesting, any imagery. I mean, what is what is going on here? Yeah, a wall is just a wall. I think that's one of the most famous um, lines of the poem that a wall is wa just a wall and nothing more. All it can be broken down. Um, uh, locked by the lawless yeah i think that's really strong and so applicable always um that anything man-made can be undone absolutely what stood out to me was the theme of contrast extremes of human experience but life prevails and continues despite everything absolutely i think you have on the one hand this imagery of seeds growing into sprouts sprouts going into trees and the kind of um inevitability of I would say like res natural resistance. And then at the same time you have like maggots, bloodthirsty maggots, you have, you know, people trying to destroy daylight itself. Um, and I think, yeah, I, I think there's something really interesting in that. Is there anything else that people, um, yeah, I mean, anything else that stood out or that, that kind of linked to anything else that you're thinking about? Um, so I think this is a really strong um, poem. I'm gonna, leave it here um i have seen the death parade sculpting yeah 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 that's such a strong but sculpting with bodies in its path so visual and powerful yeah otherworldly transition from kind to blind to bind really vivid and clear to me absolutely um so what i actually want us to do um is uh oh yeah so i think oh gosh sorry but it's actually kind of <laughs> chaotic to have screen sharing yeah so uh, what what stands out to me as a kind of essence of this poem and the reason i selected it is that I think this embodies in a way, and there's many different ways it could look, what I see as kind of a turning away from um, answering type of poem. And what I mean by that is I think a lot of times, a lot of poetry, um, particularly when it's to do, I suppose, with uh, power dynamics and particularly racial and kind of global colonial power dynamics, I think it sometimes can, can be a lot about answering this question of you know um what what we are not so what i like about this poem is that it is not i am not da, da, da. i am not this um i do not believe that it, i think by by it being an i believe poem an affirmative poem i think this takes us into that space of rather than turning just rather than just turning away from it's turning to something and i think asata shakur has kind of embodied this thing of it doesn't she she's kind of done away with i would say the colonial trap of answering to this colonial gaze this voyeur who always demands that you answer right explain yourself make yourself intelligible rather than making herself intelligible to you know any kind of colonial technologies whether that's through language or through anything else i see this as she's saying forget that i don't care i'm this poem is about me and what i believe in and how how belief itself has a kind of fire to it um and I think that for me is what I'm interested in in here. And so I'm gonna um, set you kind of two different tasks. Um, and I would suggest you do them in this order um, and take 10 minutes for both both of them. And you know, feel free to take a break in the middle or whatever and grab a cup of tea or whatever you need to do. But for the first 10 minutes, I would like you to take any image from this poem, um, take any any image and and use that as a prompt to write your own poem. So you, it could be, as somebody said earlier, that you know the visceral image is really um, the visceral imagery. Sorry, is really um, good. So you know maybe it's, you take the line, "I have seen the destruction of the daylight," right? And you take that and now you apply that to your experiences, your life, whatever it is that you you know that evoked for you, and from there you you use that as the first line of your poem. You see what I mean? So. 
now I've seen the destruction of the daylight and now turn that into whatever piece that is for you. You know, maybe that you would just extend one of her metaphors. Um, it may be that you move on or you take that poem somewhere else. Um, it may be that you use it to tell a story that you need to tell. Um, but I would like, as I say, to, I would like you to situate it in that this kind of feeling that we're talking about right now where we're not answering to anybody, we're kind of situating ourselves. And what I don't want you to do is choose the line I believe in um, because the second prompt and the second activity I want you to do for 10 minutes is take I believe in and I want you to essentially write your own uh, version of this poem and I say that not in the sense that I want you to copy you know it, it's style content or anything like that but the notion that I talked about earlier this affirmative um, de like using our own language, imagery, word, definitions to talk about ourselves, because I think one of the most violent parts of colonialism um, and what, you know, what justifies and enables those material extractions, that material um, kind of, you know, um, uh, domination is defining things as yours, right? So Europeans say this is ours, or th Europeans say this is lesser, this is uncivilized, this is barbaric, we are superior, we are, whatever the words and the language are, this language has allowed and affirmed violence, right? And so on the other hand, I want us to use language to affirm our own, you know, definitional paradigms, basically, what is it that we believe in? Who are we? So uh, I'll put that in the chat. Um, I'll try and yeah, I'll I'll leave this up, but this chat. So hopefully that makes sense. Oh gosh, keep doing that. So I'll give you basically. Um, there we go. So first task: take one line, use it as a prompt to begin your own poem. Um, continue for ten minutes, and the second one: begin with "I believe" and write your own version. So if you have any questions let me know otherwise i'll bring us all back together in you know about 20 minutes um yeah i'll be here again put, put yourself in the context that you need to be in if you need music if you don't whatever i'll leave this up so you can take the lines and you can refer back to it it's a bit blurry okay um i think you can i think you actually have the option if you're on zoom to um, select how you're viewing the screen so you can actually zoom it you can choose for it to be zoomed in on because the only thing is if I zoom in um, you'll lose part of the poem so if you can find that option um, you'll see you're able to zoom in otherwise if you actually if you just yeah thank you Zoya yeah if you just um, google search it then you'll have it So just to say that you might want to move into the second exercise now if you've um, been working on the first one. Um, and again, with this, um, just begin with, you can begin with either I believe in living or just I believe and don't feel tied to the structure um, of this poem. Yours might literally just be a list of things you believe, but it might be moving you towards something that is a space of not just what we don't stand for, but what you do. You guys still have a few minutes. Um, if you're finding it really hard, honestly, just make a list. Like I believe in, I believe in, I believe in, and it can start with really basic things and it can move into things that you might be surprised about. Um, but yeah, try not to do it with too much pressure on yourself. And if you find it difficult, go have a cup of tea, leave your computer, try writing in a paper pad instead. Do you know what I mean? Just give yourself options and don't be hard on yourself. We've got maybe two more minutes.
Okay, one more minute, guys. Um, me included, just finish your last, the last sentence you were on. Um, oh, no worries. Thank you. Um, thanks for being here and take care. Um, yeah. Okay, guys, so um, if we all come back now, um, I don't know how people found that. Let me know in the chat, like, how was that? I know some people said it was a bit difficult. Um, I'd be interested to know if it was, um, yeah, how it was for you. Um, I also just had a go um, writing on my phone notes and it was, yeah, it wasn't, I think the point isn't like you're trying to write the best thing ever, but I think I found it interesting to try and think about, it's really tempting to keep writing about, you know, what I don't agree or believe with. Um, but I think it's interesting to write like this. Um, I tend to try and read something that I've also just written in the workshop just to prove that we don't exp like, <laughs> I, I find it really hard to write under pressure in time too. Um, and I think that's really natural, but hopefully if I read this, it will encourage some of you to share um, what you've written um, at the end too. So I, yeah, I don't really know like how much of this makes sense, but these were some of the things I wrote. Um, I believe in people, I believe in their stories of unimaginable feats and unevidenced reasons. I believe in trust, in needing only the presence of a person to invite them into your home. I believe in generosity, and I have seen people hoard what is not theirs in order to keep it from whose it was. I have seen the beach become the border and the border become the prison, making empty shells of storytellers, making us make cages of each other. I believe in disobedience. I believe in holding hands, that even a life jacket filled with lead cannot bring you to the ocean floor if someone is holding your hand. I believe in holding, I believe in not letting go. I have seen children hold onto promises years past the time they were broken. I have seen dreams birthed in desolation set fire to the waking night of tyranny. So I believe in imagination. I believe in other possibilities and that even as deep as a line has been dug into sand, it can be washed away. For the sea moves to its own rhythm and I believe a multitude of people holding hands is a type of sea. I believe in motion, I believe in practice, I believe in the work of love and that our best ideas cannot happen alone. I believe in beginnings because I believe in ends and I believe that anything with a beginning can be brought to an end. I believe in people. So yeah, not, my, not, not something that I would necessarily keep as that, but it's like something to work from, I think. Whatever you've written today, hopefully you can see it as a draft to build on. Um, so I hope you at least have a couple of lines in what you've written that you, you are happy with. Um, so thinking on this same theme of asking questions back, revealing structures and not focusing so much on ourselves, um, not having to explain ourselves, but instead just revealing what we see, what we experience, what we hear, what we know. And I, I would like to put emphasis on that as well, revealing what we know. I think poetry and this idea of, I think particularly as artists focus on belief, like believing as, as a, a kind of validation of the truth that we know to be true, even when the whole world says it is not. And I think that is inherently uh, a practice of, of of decoloniality in that sense of if colonization and coloniality tells us there is only one truth and that truth is a truth that has never benefited us then i think decolonizing and decoloniality and thinking and speaking in that way is about saying that our embodied knowledge our feelings what we believe what we see what we experience in the world is of an in of itself a truth um and that through sharing that truth we can hold a mirror up to the world and so rather than kind of the, the truth itself being the focus that this is inherently um where i want you to look it's through my personal truth i'm showing you there is something wrong in this world i'm showing you the structures i'm revealing the system um so i hope that makes some sense um and i thought a good example of kind of the different uh, the like the way i differentiate between a poem that kind of moves us to that looking holding up the mirror basically that's how i see it so there's poems that look in the mirror and then there's poems that hold up the mirror to the onlooker to the listener and that's what i'm interested in that second one how we move there um and i think an interesting example of this a lot of poems um i think it like i think it's a lot of poems that um i've heard um kind of center on names like people's names right and sometimes when we're thinking around white supremacy, but particularly colonialism, um, I think we think about things like names being mispronounced. Um, and when we're thinking about language, we think about this as well. And I think that's fine and it has its place. But I think 
what I'm saying when I say like look, the difference between looking in the mirror and holding the mirror up is there's a difference between a poem that focuses on the pain or the kind of erasure of, of a mispronounced or misunderstood name. And then there's another poem that says the mispronunciation is not the problem. There's something else going on. And it's that that I want to bring your attention to. And I want to de-individualize the issue essentially and, and shed my light on the systems. So I've chosen a poem to share with you that um, it's a slam poem. It's a group slam poem. Um, I, I really enjoy slam poetry. I think it's really important. And I think it's, um, you know, I, I think it's often seen as like a derivative of like real poetry, but obviously throughout the history of the world, majority of poetry has been performance um, and storytelling and performative in that sense. So um, I'm going to share this poem on my screen. Hopefully you can all hear it. Um, and I think just to say, try to watch for that shift where I think it starts in a way of kind of, oh, you know, here's the personal story. And then I think there's a real shift where it moves to we're revealing something about the coloniality of the world through the experience we have of having names. Um, and so I'm going to share that um, on my screen. So hopefully this will work. Um, give me one second. No, that is not it. Um, and again, just feel free to note down anything that sort of stands out to you, um, what you think is useful. And bear in mind that um, I'm obviously going to be using this as a prompt. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, prompt for the next exercise. So. I'm going to share my screen in just a second, if this allows me to. Yeah. Okay, share screen. Sorry. Right, sorry, that's a bit chaotic. So hopefully you can see that. Can anybody just put in the chat box that you can see that so I know what's happening? <laughs> yeah, you can see. Okay, great. So here we go. And can you hear as well? Teachers used to say, your behavior is just like your last name, unforgettable. In school, I learned a lot more about other people's names rather than the ones closer to my own, as if Madame Yamazawa Acevedo were so much harder to say than Shikovsky, Michelangelo, Eisenhower, like our last names were made of barbed wire, stripping the flesh of those trying to conquer the meanings in their mouths. See, my parents named me George, but honestly, I always hated the name George. It reminds me of some old dead white guy. Being a young, alive Asian boy, it was hard for me to make the connection. I realized my first name didn't match my background before I knew how to spell assimilation. I always wanted a name that set the bar high, that tumbled out of mouths, somersaulted into a room and split the air. A name like Sochi or Anacaona, but although I must have punched inside the placenta, my parents decided on something placid. Elizabeth. Elizabeth. A name for princesses, pampered women, and perfume. A name full of grace. A, a name easily washed down with milk. Patrick, meaning leader. Etymology, Irish. And although I speak French, I am from Cameroon. Bamileke et douala, un lion indomptable. I would rather a name that would make a throat swell into a song rather than a sigh. Your, Your name, name is, is a song. song. So now I call myself Pages so I can write my own story. It is the only name that I have ever owned. And I wanted a name of Dominican Hills Rising and Campesinos Uprising instead of Long Live the Queen, but shorten my name to live so colonizers had less to hold on to. You see, in Japan, in Japan, your last name comes first. There's an emphasis on family. But, but in America, America, your nickname comes first because there's an emphasis on accessibility. Our, our parents, parents had to dumb down our identity so our, our family could fit into a straight-jacket society. Yo, on countless occasions, I've introduced myself and people would say shit like, But what's your real name, though? That, that don't sound very ethnic. ethnic. You don't look like a George. Or a Patrick. And Elizabeth. That's because my name wasn't given to me. It was given to the rest of the country. Because when, because when they hear, because when they hear names like George, Patrick, Elizabeth, what they hear is power, class, intellect. But names like Pedimonte, Quivangene, Tatsunokochi sound like foreign, impoverished, illegal. What they hear is go back where you came from. Your name is a dirt pit. It is a black hole. But what they don't know is that black holes be the brightest source of light. I've always wished my name was dressed in chain mail, that it was a heavy name of thick thigh syllables shot down with short blades. So when I have my own children, I'm going to name them something special. 
Something to make people stumble on and guilt trip over. Something to make their skin a little thicker than mine. Something to remind their classmates of the last samurai instead of the first president. Something, something powerful. powerful. Something, something real, real, real ethnic. ethnic. Something unforgettable. Um, so I, I love that poem. Uh, I've listened to it so many times, but um, I do, I think it's really, um, I really feel like it does. Yeah, it is amazing. I, I'm glad, I'm glad she agreed, I'm glad it's not just me. Um, I mean, I, before I go into why I love it, I mean, did any, what stood out? Like, why is it, why is it so moving? Why are people saying they've got, you know, they're moved? Um, yeah, definitely I'll share the link, of course. But yeah, let me know why why you, why it's so moving. Yeah, that's the link in case you want to, you know, share it. Yeah, their voices, the energy, definitely. Um, and I think going back to the th like the actual content itself, like I think for me, I mean, there's so many lines that stand out. But, you know, even just the la you know, some are salted out of mouths and split the air. Um, princesses, pampered women, and perfume. There's a real alliteration. They put like a lot of effort. Um, I think it's really powerful when um, Pages, the third guy, when he um, erupts into not speaking English because we suddenly like lose the kind of um, intelligibility again. We can't control. We can't understand. And I think that speaks to that wider thing of the poem. Um, and I think this idea of them imagining their own names that, you know, th these are the names we've now given ourselves. It's about imagining an alternative relationship to modernity, to white supremacy, where they are evading. You know, she said, my name is now too, too um, short. It's Liz. It's Liz rather than Elizabeth. So I made it short so they can't be kind of caught as easily. And, um, you know, um, Pat, the guy called Patrick, he's changed his name to Pages so he can kind of reclaim it. And I think the reason for me the line that stood out the most i mean tell me if you agree or disagree but was the the line where they say um that's because my name wasn't given to me it was given to the rest of the country and what i call those moments in poems are yeah exactly my exactly i call those moments revelatory moments in poems where there's a kind of story, a story has been told, a personal story. This is a story about people's names, you know, oh, people say, is that really your name? Okay, that, that's, that's a poem in of itself, right? But when they move that poem to that revelatory moment where they, they, ex they, they expose to us through this kind of, this, this kind of symbolic twist, they expose this poem you thought was about me, you thought it was about my name, about us, it's about you society about a system of white supremacy of colonialism uh, of linguistic authority of of language of assimilation of all these kinds of they managed to touch on a huge birth of things and i think that to me is what i'm trying to get at here when i'm talking about this move that we can make in our poems where i think this goes back to what somebody said at the beginning about can we use poetry to provoke to disrupt and, and then that's what i think I think we can <laughs> is the answer and I think we can disrupt through that through kind of this this use of words to reveal and it doesn't take I think sometimes people think that takes writing something really huge really grand um but I would suggest instead we all poems are that are powerful are powerful because they are personal and you know as we all know the personal is inherently political but sometimes that inherent politicalness has to be revealed I think um and I think that's the beauty of it. So I wasn't quite sure if this prompt would work for everybody, but I think that it can. Um, yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's such a universal experience. People mispronouncing um, ethnic names. Exactly. Exactly. I completely agree. And I think that's why it works as well. It's something that we, we kind of, I feel like you kind of think you know where that poem's going and then it becomes something slightly different. And to be honest, I, you know, I, I didn't expect that when I heard it the first time. And I think that's why I love it so much is that it's like, oh, it takes me to that place I didn't know it was gonna take me. Um, so as an exercise, as a prompt, what I would like um, you to do or us all to do um, is, so take, I, I would say, take your own name. Um, if this feels not applicable, then take a per something personal to you or take something a line from that poem perhaps watch that poem um, and use a line from that but otherwise i would say take your own name as a prompt and just for um 10 minutes i'll say i want you to use a similar notion of 
everybody I think has a story to do with their name, right? Everybody has something, whether that's just even explaining the meaning of your name, right? Some people have really like complex meanings to their names, or it can be an interaction to do with your name, a story, a time it was, you know, whatever, something to do with your name, a story. But through telling that story, I want you to expose a power dynamic. I don't want the poem to, to, kind of begin and end on that same story if you see what I mean through telling that story I want you to tell something else how do you come along with that revelatory moment so I think it, it's actually about you delving into that story in its deepest depth because I think sometimes when we delve into our own stories um we get we kind of fixate on the feeling as a kind of end of in of itself but I think if you push past the feeling and you ask the certain questions you can ask and I'm about to tell you them now I think that will help you right so um, and I'll, I'll put this in the chat afterwards as well, but I think what I want you to kind of see this, this prompt as is tell us about the world that we live in through telling us about your name. Okay. And that might sound complex, but I think what I would ask you to do is to write, start, begin, and it may be as simple as beginning with my name is XYZ. My name is Sahima. Sahima means da da da. And now move into a story. And the questions I would ask to maybe help you move to that re re revealing, revelatory moment is, um, who benefits so in the story who benefits what is justified and what is hidden um and these are questions that i ask about lots of things all the time because i think when it comes to language and words in general we can always ask this you know who benefits from this narrative what does it justify what does it hide um and the same thing can be said of this so you know what they asked is essentially that in their poem you know people are mispronouncing my name who benefits from that what does it justify what does it hide um i was given a name elizabeth i seem like an elizabeth who benefits from my name being elizabeth ah it's not me it's the world. So do you see what I mean? So I think that's, these are the two questions. I'll just put them there. Um, who benefits? What does it justify? What does it hide? Um, and the exercise, as I say, um, is just using your name. If that doesn't feel like it can work for you, um, think about maybe someone else in your family's name or, or, or a story to do with kind of name giving or or some sort, I think we all have a story or a context, right? To do that name. And, and it should reveal some sort of power dynamic. Um, if you're really struggling, then you know, feel free to put, put in the chat and I can kind of come up with a different prompt. But otherwise, just, just find your own prompt through that poem. Um, does that make sense? So using your name, you're trying to tell us something about the world. Um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And sometimes it's people themselves who will choose to provide um, you know, a shortened version of their name. And that's, I think, the, the, we're not trying to pass judgment on whether that in of itself is good or bad, but what that says about the world we live in. And so I think that, again, let's try and move it there. So um, 10 minutes, beginning now. Um, and I'll just write up the, the whole thing again in the chat box in case anyone missed it. Um, I think that is about 10 minutes so just again bring to an end whatever you're doing and just to remind you like these different bits of writing that you might have done today feel free to expand on them afterwards like the hope I find when I'm kind of working with prompts and resources is just that maybe one line or a couple of lines it, it are something that I'm you know excited by and want to build on but I hope you have more than that I hope maybe there's you know a whole 10 minutes worth of poem that you are happy with um so um yeah i don't know did anyone want to reflect on that like was it difficult was it easy did anything come to mind um how, yeah how was that before we move on oh and also somebody said earlier when you guys type in the chat box if you're able to do it to all panelists and attendees then everybody can see um because i realized I, I must have been talking to people who other people couldn't see um it was a powerful exercise amazing it was cathartic that's really good to hear I'm, I'm really glad um quite difficult to apply those questions that's fine um i hope maybe you found some sort of other um 
way uh, into your story it was hard very weird thinking deeply about your name like looking in the mirror and re-recognizing yourself really interesting okay well i hope some of you feel um up to sharing some of what you've written um in the next kind of uh, what well, before the end of the session um i would love to hear some of it um the final exercise oh yeah i was thinking about the depth of my name today it was a really great exercise i really enjoyed it i'm really glad to hear that i'm really glad guys that's that's really good um yeah <laughs> so much hiding when just supposed to be existing and I think that's that thing going back to that Toni Morrison quote right that like so much of um existence under colonial modernity is just people explaining themselves and essentially justifying their existence um and I think that in of itself is a trap right she says that you know actually this is what racism is it distracts us um uh so yeah I wanted to move into the final um exercise that I have um have planned um and it's really the same premise here um in the sense of you know using something questioning so, uh, questioning something that happened to us or that we hear or that we feel and using it to to reveal something about the world um and again this is about moving on from you know i am not what you say i am or this you know that's not true and so the example i'm going to share with you is one of my own poems um and i'm just going to share the youtube video of it because i feel like it's weird to perform to you guys maybe it's more with the other video i'm not sure um but i'm just going to ask you to watch it and um again note to yourself what stands out um you don't need to tell me necessarily but just note to yourself in your notebook or whatever and i, I want you to think about a narrative that you hear a lot in relation to the way your identity is formed and that you want to speak back to um, so not just saying this narrative is wrong or I'm going to disprove this narrative, but trying to reveal the purpose of that narrative. Okay. So in this poem, I'll just kind of introduce it a bit before I, I show it. Um, the narrative that I had heard that I wanted to think about was, you know, this idea that, um, Muslim people um, are not British. They don't have British values or there's a lack of Britishness or something like this. And rather than writing a poem that was like, oh, Muslims are British too, or, no, that's not true. I am British or something like that. Um, I wanted because I felt like that would have just been that kind of, you know, exhausting, um, you know, amplifying racism almost that Toni Morrison talks about. Instead, it's going to the next level and saying, who benefits from this assertion? What does it allow to happen in the world? What does it hide and what does it justify? And um, I hope you see that. I hope that makes sense. Like, I'm sorry that I'm kind of hammering this message, but I just think it's really exciting for us to be able to write like that because then we to, be able to ask those questions sorry, because then we can write in a more disruptive way. So just watch this. Um, I'll put the prompt in the chat and then try to think of a narrative, as I say, that it is relevant um, to your um, life. So yeah, sorry, this is a bit weird to be showing you my own poem, but then again, what can you do? <laughs> right, so let me find the thing. Uh, there goes, share screen. Share audio, here it is. Okay. And hopefully this works like before so you can see and hear. There we go. Young Muslims in Britain often straddle two worlds. They appear to have a foot in each culture concerns revealed around the national identification of Muslims in Britain. Review raises alarm over social integration in the UK schools to promote fundamental British values. The face of Britain is changing beyond recognition. I look in the mirror. It's not shattered. I am whole. No one foot in, one foot out. No reason I've got to learn Britishness from the somehow more devout. I'm not uneasy, torn, or straddling. It's not shattered. I am whole. Yet the opposite is somehow all that you'll get told. I mean, I guess because if it wasn't, if we faced up to the glass, you'd be left with the fact that I am inside. I am Britain now. Because Britain is Bismillah, Britain is Basmati rice, Britain is box braids and black barbers shops, Bollywood and Bangara, Britain is body popping outside the tube, Britain is Brick Lane before it was cool, Britain is bilingual, Britain is the broker, Britain is praying in the changing rooms, Britain has its feet in your sink, Britain is bad at knowing itself, belligerent and boring. Britain has not changed beyond recognition. Recognise it was never one thing. I am the inside you pretend is outside, but we have to stop pretending. 
Pretending the rolling hills are just romantic, not remnants of injustices swept under a rug. Like the tea didn't come from Asia, like the sugar wasn't grown by slaves, like dry humour isn't a way to just ridicule dissent and cues don't expose the way we're always told to wait for change rather than making it. And it's funny that over-apologising is seen as a national trait, because half of history is still waiting. <laughs> I look in the mirror. It's not shattered, I am whole, there is no brink or turning point, I'm here. Britain is barbaric. Oh, sorry, did you think that was me? Barbaric bystanders straddling the boundary, not quite inside, so you could say I'm the things you forgot, like you're modern, so I'm backwards, you're democratic, so you say I'm not. When the truth is, Britain is blood on its hands and back to the wall. Britain is selling weapons to the most repressive regimes in the world. Britain is the bombs the Saudis drop on Yemen. Britain is building surveillance apparatus since 9-11. Britain is believing in human rights whilst removing them all. Britain is Yard's Wood, Brook House, Colne Brook and Morton Hall. Britain is 1,600 dead in or after police custody since 1990. And Britain has no qualms about detaining asylum seekers indefinitely. Britain is suicide attempts, secret courts and secret torture. Britain is stopping you at the border. Britain is seeing it, saying it, sorting it, which means Britain is also deporting it, because <laughs> what else do you do when you look in the mirror and find the sugar and tea had strings attached. The factories on the rolling hills depended on our labour. The bombs destroyed the homes of kids now at the border. Britain is barbaric. Britain is blindly patriotic. Britain is built on false narratives, slices of other people's dishes. Britain is stolen artefacts in museums named after itself. Britain is knife and fork polite, stabbing you at will. Britain is selective. Yours till it's not. In yours till it's not. Then blaming you. Britain is borders, Britain is Brexit, Britain is spending on weddings but not fireproofing homes. Britain is cutting mental health services yet somehow strong and stable. Britain is 40% of young people in custody being from ethnic minority backgrounds and Britain is blaming them for this statistic rather than asking difficult questions because Britain is blaming the kids who aren't white. Britain is blaming the immigrants. Britain is blaming the Muslims. Britain is blaming bureaucracy. Britain is not listening. Britain is not that great. Britain is breaking. But breaking everywhere except the place it puts the blame. Because there's only a few things left that are great about Britain. And there that Britain is Bismillah, Basmati and Bilingual. Box braids and black barbers shops, Bollywood and Bungara. Body popping outside the tube, Brick Lane before it was cool. Britain is the broker. Britain is praying in the changing rooms. Britain has its feet in your sink. Britain is your greatest nightmare, every repercussion you never thought through. Britain is the mind to be got inside. Britain is the terror to be counted. I am the great and great Britain now. And aren't you terrified? Okay, um, so the purpose of that, as I said, is that you take from that, I hope, what I try to do in that poem is move away, as, as you might have seen at the beginning, I think there's a tendency that I was going into like, I am British, you know, that's wrong, I'm not straddling any lines, I'm not stuck between two cultures, that's not fair, and then I moved on from that into, who cares what I am, what, well let's actually analyse what is Britain? What's this, what, is this, what does this whole Britain thing mean? What does this narrative mean that I'm not this thing that you're saying is good to be? Well, actually, let's excavate and explore that. So um, what I want you to do, as I say, is, is take a narrative, and it can be from political rhetoric, it could be from media, it could be from popular culture, it could be a film, TV, anywhere. And, and I'm sure we all have some <laughs> narrative somewhere that is to do with some aspect of our identity. Um, and I want you to not write a poem that says, this is not true. Um, I want you instead to say, what does this narrative do? What does it allow for? And the writing obviously can be different. So, so as you saw in that poem, I, you, some of that is actually just very like fact-based, right? And it's, it's empirical, it's literally just like, this is some statistics, here's some facts. But I think the way that you present that can, can make it okay, you know, it can work still. Um, or it can be, you could use imagery, right? So you can, you know, there's the, the other angle, which is me saying not, oh, I am British, but Britain is basmati, bilingual, it's the burqa, and I'm giving all these images of what Britain is, which disrupts this notion itself, right? So either through imagery, through narrative, through lists, through whatever form you want to use, metaphors, through even just using, you know, non-English, whatever, I sorry to use the word non-English, I just feel like I don't, I, I don't want to like pick on any um, specific languages, but using any language other than English um, and kind of inverting, um, yeah, inverting those norms of poetry, you are going to do your version of, of, an, of kind of a questioning a narrative. So 
I'm gonna give you 10 more minutes. So it's half past now. So you have till 22. I'm glad that makes sense, Francis. That's good. I'm glad. Um, so you have 22. Um, and then I'll just, I'm hoping some of you might want to share either this or some of the other writing that you've, you've written. So I'll give us till 22. I'll put the prompt again in the chat box in case it hasn't made sense. But please make yourself, you know, go for it. Really put, put your heart and soul into this one because we all have something we need to speak back to. And I think this way of speaking moves us beyond having to excavate our experiences and say, I'm going to prove myself, I'm going to justify myself, I'm going to explain myself. No, we're going to instead ask what it is that you are doing when you uh, mobilize that narrative, okay? Yeah, so 10 minutes, off we go. Okay, so just two more minutes, guys, um, or one more minute, just rounding up. Um, here, the instructions um, were just there above. Um, I don't know if you missed that or if you've seen it now. Oh, okay. Um, it doesn't matter. We were just doing, I'll, I'll post the comment again. Okay, guys, so I'm going to encourage everybody to come to an end. Um, okay. I hope that felt useful i hope that you got something out of it um i feel like yeah i've tried to make it very clear obviously that the underlying principle here is you know if, if coloniality uses language we also can use and subvert language and if it uses def defining and um kind of reifying concepts through language we can disrupt that by questioning the edges of those concepts questioning the the validity of those narratives and who they benefit and what they hide and what they justify so remembering those three questions um would people like to just maybe just post in the chat so just so i can kind of get a sense of uh, you know how that is how you're feeling how that was um and i would love to invite you to share your work um so the way that that can work is that um basically you should have how many pieces should you have so you should have written let me have a quick check so you have your free write that's for you um you should have two kind of poems based on the asata shakur poem um you should have something to do with your name um and then you should have this final so you should have four pieces essentially ish um and you may have something completely other that you you know got distracted with and it is kind of has excited you instead um so usually like when I do these workshops, I can see everybody and so they can kind of contribute uh, in their own ways. Um, but I would love to still hear from anybody and hear your work because I think that's a really nice way to end workshops usually. Um, and I'm sure what we can facilitate if it makes people more comfortable is to just like stop the recording for um, if people do want to share. So would anybody be interested in sharing? Um, and this is like with a completely non like, you know, judgment free kind of space just to I think a big part of sharing our work in these spaces is to kind of celebrate. Um, okay, so Hippa, that's amazing. Um, I think, okay, Safa, okay, amazing. So I think um, Kumi, who is um, back, backstage, I'm gonna say backstage, um, is hopefully gonna be able to facilitate elevating you to this um, space that I'm in. I don't know what to call these things, to, to the panelist bit that I'm in. Um, and hopefully then you will be able to contribute and also suffer um, and if anybody else hopefully that will prompt other people also to contribute so I really appreciate you guys um, being up for it um, Kumi are we able to do that amazing looks like Hibbert is here um, so Hibbert if you want to unmute yourself um, if you can that's okay. <laughs> Lovely to yeah. see you. Um, how was that for you? I'm excited to hear your work. Um, yeah, it was just, obviously, I've, for so long, I've 
not for so long obviously but um your book that you published I've just followed you for quite a long time and it prompts me so much um and yeah like it's been great because um like I think just this idea of wanting to change and really like disrupt and just everything you thought you knew is wrong like every thought every like not obviously everything but you know a lot of things that we're taught it's you don't have to necessarily agree with it and I'm just like yes I'm here for it I'm here for because it's not necessarily like um beneficial for the people that live here as well like you know our education system is not beneficial it's not beneficial to aim for a stars when really it's just a grade and like I left education when I was 18 because I just couldn't do it I was in the middle of my levels I had about six months to go and I just left it and you know you I'm from an Asian family you get all that stigma and you know it was so hard and I'm still struggling but it's fine right and some of the most knowledgeable people never had formal education so I'm happy then that way but yeah it's still quite tough yeah no um, definitely. Thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate that um are we can I ask you to share some of your something maybe anything that you feel comfortable that you wrote today um, um, yeah sure um can I start my video um is yeah, that okay yeah. hi oh, hey. <laughs> I'm having a right now um but yeah um, I, I don't know maybe they'll check afterwards but are you okay with it being recorded um I'm okay, okay awesome. right whenever you're ready um yeah okay uh I started before I really wanted to read how um biography I lent it to someone before reading it massive mistake <laughs> to read it <laughs> um I don't know which one to do I think I'll do the I believe one um awesome. can I read the gag by the greedy like that was just a line it's quite a sh short piece um and then I'll read the longer piece is that okay <laughs> okay. <laughs> um okay I thought gagged by the greedy isn't that what capital capitalism is about? This lifestyle we've adapted, our supermarkets, options too much, grossly unnecessary, gagged by the greedy to make strong a shattered country, deport us when you're done. Oh, oh, quite a strong ending. All right, nice, nice, nice. Next one, go on. Um, okay. I believe in God's plan in, what, in waking every day and new and forgiving before sleeping. I believe in hope, yes. Um, we live a life because subculture has changed. I believe in reverse, in the, in the, sh <laughs> I can't read my handwriting. Okay, I'm gonna, um, sea levels, uh, oh, in shores settling, in sea levels declining, in trusting nature signs, have foretold warnings. I believe in breathing, running outside to dawn song, to morning exchanges, to smiling. Um, to smiling more, even though um, it surely hurts. I believe in revival of heritage, of belonging, of, I can't read my handwriting, of letting go and putting down technology for it cannot give you compassion. I believe in Rahma, like Al Rahman, the compassionate. I believe in silence, sitting down with oneself, um, being uncomfortable with yourself, mm. exploring one's mind, forgiving oneself, because I believe you should aim for perfection. You should strive for it, but having the humility to know it shall never be attained. Mm. I believe in loving all and one and one and all, the universe, what it encompasses, and I believe in tolerance. Wow, I think there were some really beautiful lines in there. I really... I really liked the stuff around, uh, about nature as well, the, the kind of believing in like um, the, the natural world speaking to you and telling you it's um, te speak, giving us messages basically. And uh, also the, yeah, Rahma, I believe in I re Yeah, there's some beautiful lines in there. I, I wish I could have seen it written. Thank you so much for sharing that. And um, yeah, we're very grateful to you being here. Uh, it's very, yeah, it's very messy. So I barely... <laughs> understood my own yeah, it, was uh, it was beautiful and I think the beauty of these these prompts anyways that you know you can go to that and you can move it and mesh it and change it and, and work on it however you like um yeah. but thank you so much Hiba. um you're welcome I wrote um a piece about my mother tongue like before this and I just wanted to share it with you really quick not like the actual piece but um you know the whole when you were recording in the park um and you wrote like a little piece um I wrote a piece about how like my mother's tongue is English, but she's not part English. 
she was just born to a country where she spoke it um and it's quite a long piece and it was like um yeah uh thank you <laughs> oh, no, no, cool. yeah do share that yeah thank you so much Emma. um i'm gonna because i can see a couple of other people saying they want to share so um, is it all right if I ask uh, someone else to, I think, um, Safa, it looks like the next person, and then Salma, and um, you've got some nice comments there, Hiba, as well, from other people. Um, oh, yeah, thank you. There is the Asasa Shakur um, autobiography is um, online, as um, Safa has pointed out. Um, but yeah, if, like, again, anybody else, feel free also to share. Um, it's, yeah. Oh, here we go. Here's Safa. Um, feel free to unmute yourself and unvideo or video yourself. There you go. Hi. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Lovely to see you. Lovely to see you too. I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing something. Um, this this was really amazing. Thank you for the prompts. They're really, really good. And um, they're very like deep. Like it took me a while to actually get started. Yeah, so I really appreciated that. Well, uh, awesome. The one that I wrote about was um, the Asara Shakur affirmation. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's kind of short, but um, here I go. Um, I believe in the one true God. I believe that he watches over me. I believe that I am not so small as to be inconsequential and unworthy of his attention. I believe that I have a family, one that extends far beyond the four corners of this home. Each member's name I do not know, but I love them fiercely, and my heart burns at their hurt. I believe I belong to something bigger than myself. I believe I have purpose. I believe I hail from desert hunters, dune lovers, freedom fighters, men and women that become shadows when the sun's light flickers out, that disappear amongst history books, whose presence resonates when I think of home. I believe that the sun and the moon and all astral bodies are in our universe are suspended by the one. I believe in good, I believe in evil, perhaps I could be both, and I have seen his love. I believe it may be all that I need. Oh, beautiful. The imagery was so, I love that bit about um, being from uh, freedom fighters and then the history and the shadows. Sorry, I'm pretty paraphrasing, but it was really beautiful imagery. And I think also just uh, your poem is a really good reminder and, and Hibbers as well of like how, you know, I think part of disrupting coloniality is also, um, you know, giving voice to and legitimizing non-secular narratives because of course secularism is part of colonial modernity so really appreciate you sharing that stuff and um yeah really beautiful so thank you thank you for giving me the chance to share of course no we, we all appreciate it and you can see the comments people people are already <laughs> loving it as well um i think there was someone else Salma. i think is i right in remembering that name um i don't know how to do this yeah oh thank you so oh, sorry that you disappeared um um i think no i can't see oh oh yeah oh everyone's name is sort of there we go now i can see here we go oh salma there she is okay great hey can you hear me yeah, yeah we can hear you oh. <laughs> so thank you i'm good thank you um i came in late so i was only able to do the last one oh, that's great. a little that's bit incomplete but um so it's basically about um, my mother. She has an accent because she speaks Arabic, first language, um, and just sort of the, it's kind of like my response to the narrative that people uh, create yeah. with that. Yeah. So, here we go. Um, can you dance the neck? That is to say, shrink the space between you and sky as your shoulder blades move like they have wings. Can you make syrup out of language? That is to say, to know every word your tongue is capable of and perform alchemy. Can you flavor meat and kill the animal that made it? Can you use a bundle of straw to sweep dust from dust to sweep sweat to salvation? And that's it. <laughs> I love that. Oh, I really love that. That's so cool. The images and the, I just, yeah, I love that you also didn't specify. It's very cl clear and subtle what you're saying, who you're saying it to. And I think it's a really beautiful, um, testament to your mom as well and I hope you can you. share that with her in some way I think thanks so much <laughs> um yeah great responses as well there in the comments oh, so, yeah, you, lovely to meet you as well and you thank you for running this you're amazing <laughs> awesome. um I think there was a couple of other people and the comments are coming in so fast that I can't see um yeah it was absolutely stunning and you can yeah oh thanks guys to everyone who's shared I think Somebody raised their hand and I didn't know if that meant that you wanted to share. I think Francis, was that you? Um, and 
there was someone else oh yeah Fra okay so i think francis um Kumi, if we were able to get francis that would be good i think there was someone else but then i couldn't it's all just passed so quickly <laughs> Oh, I'm really glad people are feeling really inspired. Um, and I think listening to one another's poetry is one of the most inspiring things. Um, it's fine. Um, Francis, you'll, um, Kumi, who is the helping with the technical support, will bring, she'll, you'll kind of see something come up. Um, we've got five more minutes, so I think we'll just hear from Francis and maybe one more person, if if this, this can persuade anyone else. Um, here you are, Francis. If you're able to unmute yourself um, and turn on your video if you're, if you're up for it, then... Okay. Uh... Yeah. Let's see. Let me turn on my video. Oh. Hello. Hey, lovely to meet you. Hi. Nice to meet you. Thank you so much for all of this. It's been really, really interesting and um really has helped me think about some things in a different way. I'm so sorry about that. Um, yeah. So um I guess I want to share like the prompt from the Asata Shakur piece. Like I wrote something on it. Okay. Um, so yeah, it, it's relatively short and it's very rough, but um, yeah. I, I have seen the kind become the blind and the blind become the bind in one easy lesson. I have seen lies incinerate mindsets framed with falsehoods held up by gold chains and tales of sunsets on dread. I have heard myself cry out, struck silent by this shock, stuff me with sugar cane stalk. Let sweetness choke me, rip hope from my lips. Sorry, wait, <laughs> rip hope from my lips. Let it drip and drop onto the pavement and shatter. Oh, wow, that's a really, um, I was just thinking the word choice with the drip and the tear and the rip is so, it feel it, you're com you're conveying a kind of I don't know it's a very evocative feeling and I think it's really interesting because it that first set of imagery that you give feels it just gives a different feeling so I don't know I found that quite painful almost but um, yeah I really appreciate you sharing that thank you um, I'm I'm actually I'm Nigerian and right now there's like oh, it was kind of like inspired by the um, SARS protests oh, yeah. that are happening the end SARS protests. Makes a lot of sense. Thank you for explaining that. Actually, that's a really important context. Thank you. Thank all you right. so much. Thank um, you. Thank you. No, not at all. Thank you for sharing. Um, was there anybody else that want to share? We have maybe like three more minutes. Uh, <laughs> I mean, pushing it to the end. Uh, to be honest, okay, yeah, probably we don't have time in that case. Um, so before I wrap up, um, just to remind you, the next event in the festival uh, begins in three minutes, um, and it's a cross-cultural encounters panel discussion, and um, Kumi will share the uh, link in the chat. So feel free to tune into that, move over to that, there is a link. Um, thank you so much to everybody who shared. Um, I'm really actually really happy about that, and it's always really lovely to see that like the prompts and stuff have gone in so many different directions for different people um you know whether that's like reflecting on really violent context right now of, of police brutality and state violence or it's reflecting on like our relationships with our mothers or reflecting on um relationships to god like i think all of those things sit within this realm of like us being able to speak for ourselves finding voices finding ways to to um define our experiences outside of the lens of coloniality so thank you all so much for being here um Feel free to stay in touch. Um, I'll put my email in the um, chat. And um, let me just see if I had any other notes that I wanted to say. No, I did not. So thank you very much. Um, I would love to see any of the work that you wrote if you'd love to, if you if you'd like to email it to me. And um, if not, absolutely fine. Have a wonderful afternoon. And I'll let you have a sip of uh, some water before you move into the next event. <laughs> thank you so much, guys. Um, not sure if I, yeah, not sure how to end this, but I'm sure that um, Kumi will help me. <laughs>